Nubar Afayan. He is a co-founder and chairman of Moderna. So good to be with you, Nubar. Great to be here, Ian. So you're kind of the man of the year right now. I mean, when did you realize that what you've been working on is truly game changing? Well, Ian, about three, three weeks ago, we received the first look at the interim results from our phase three trial, 30,000 subjects involved. And that glimpse already indicated um, that we had a very strong statistically significant signal of efficacy at 94.5%. We kind of cracked open the whole kind of uh, the final analysis uh, of, the, of the results. Uh, and, and what we saw across 196 cases is a 94% efficacy. And importantly, we saw in serious COVID cases, a, a split of 30 to zero. 30, all 30 cases were in the placebo group, which represents 100% protection. That bodes well for a broader population. Obviously, this is a relatively small study compared to what we expect to vaccinate. But that all kind of sinks in pretty quickly. And the, the 10 months of work we've done to get to this point following 10 years of science and technology development. Uh, but the last 10 months now all of a sudden has, has shifted our emphasis and focus to how are we going to get this vaccine distributed and how do we ensure that it's safely administered and we track the folks who receive it. So there isn't much time to look back, but certainly uh, it's, a, it's a super gratifying and, and, and a sense of relief to know that the science and the technology that Moderna pioneered some 10 years ago seems to be having a pretty significant impact. As you say, this is a completely new technology. For the audience, just for give us one quick minute on, on how this works, the mRNA vaccine. What, what is it that makes this unprecedented in, in human beings? Okay, you can time me on the minute, Ian, because I've had to do this in longer and shorter times. So here it goes. So uh, the, 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 the central tenet in biology of life is that DNA is a molecule that stores information Messenger RNA, mRNA, is the piece that copies that information over to making proteins, which are the important parts that govern the functioning of different cells. So messenger RNA is what we use to deliver the information uh, to the body of the subject. And inside the body, that we have specially formulated this such that the mRNA can get into certain cells that in turn translate the mRNA into proteins, just like that the, the cells know how to do. But the protein we've coded for is a protein that is on the surface of this coronavirus. So what we're trying to do is to educate the immune system to see the protein before it's seen the virus and be ready with, with, with the arsenal of, of immune cells and antibodies to attack that protein. Now, when a virus shows up to somebody who's had their immune system activated in that way, the immune system knows exactly what it's looking for and neutralizes the virus. That's why we see this kind of efficacy. Now, there's a very, very big difference between, um, you know, the research that's required to get this vaccine uh, discovered, uh, if you will, and, and producing it uh, for uh, a billion people or more around the planet. So how, how do you do that? It's about people. It's about partnerships. We forged a, an early relationship with one of the leading, if not the largest, uh, independent contract manufacturer of biologics, a company called Lonza, publicly listed, a very good partner of ours. I'd say, but for them, we would not have quite the path that, that we've had in terms of scaling. They have a plant in, in Switzerland that they've uh, devoted a, a certain section of for this. So partnerships, people, resources, and the rest is ahead of us. There's a long, long way to go. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, uh, as, as you've seen in other industries, it helps a little not to know what you can't do. It helps a little to, to have to make it up as you go because, um, you know, there's a lot of things people think can't be done that if you are in a large company, you might actually decide, therefore, not to do. And in a pandemic, I think Moderna is certainly going from the, the initial sequence of this virus to having a designed mRNA being tested in two days and then tested in humans in four to two days, uh, I don't think a large company by any measure would dare do that because they think it's completely impossible. And not until we did it did a lot of other people join the fray and realize, oh my God, 
this can be done, we better have our own way of doing it too. We have people putting timelines out now for when, you know, it'll be normal for people again, when their step will be in line. You know, we have uh, President-elect Biden talking about a 100 days that we have to all wear masks, which, you know, you hear that, and a lot of people in the American public are gonna think on day 101, as long as we wear those masks, we'll be okay. Uh, if we've got two companies and only two companies that are putting out large numbers right now of, of what we hope are gonna be these, these vaccines for everybody, but it's never been done before, and a lot of things have to go right, shouldn't we be a lot more cautious in terms of uh, the timeline we're looking at in 2021? I agree with you that, that we're not within three months of kind of taking a deep breath and saying, okay, uh, we're, we're moving on. And that is, this is going to be a, an issue around us for many more months than that. But that does not mean that we will be embattled the way we are. We will be as scared as we are, as worried that every, every slight gathering is going to cause yet another gigantic spread. I do think that the combination of discipline, distancing, masks, all the things we've been hearing about, but now adhere to, coupled with an increasing and smart deployment of the vaccine to the right set of people so that we protect the vulnerable and those we need to support the vulnerable. I think all of that will, will conspire together to, to get us to a better place, but I don't see that through at least the middle of next year. So I think we're gonna live with a pandemic for much of 2021, but I don't think it's a binary thing. We have a pandemic and everything's awful, or the pandemic's gone, therefore everything is great again. If we're looking at when we think that, uh, you know, most Americans can actually get vaccinated, and I, I understand there are uptake issues, but in terms of production and distribution, is the level of uncertainty around that th a three-month period, a six-month period? Is it potentially a one-year period? What, what do you think we're thinking about? I think that there's a, based on everything that we've seen so far, I think that there's a reasonable expectation that come the second quarter of next year, so spring of next year, there will yep. be adequate supplies to vaccinate certainly in excess of 100 million people. And that does not rely on any kind of additional ma major new vaccines. If, if there's some new vaccines that come along, that's even better. But I would say that, that there is a path to that, but there are risks along the way, and that's what we need to keep in mind, as you're saying. Let me, let me talk a little bit about the interaction, the interdependence between uh, the producers and the U.S. government. Maybe start with Operation Warp Speed itself. Pfizer, of course, didn't take uh, money for the research. Uh, you guys did, about a billion dollars. Uh, give me a little bit of what went, um, what was the thinking behind your decision, especially since you had lots of funding sources already, to be a part uh, of uh, and receive that money from the U.S. taxpayer? Well, the, the Operation Warp Speed, let me just say at a high level, was, in my view, a, an, an, an important part of what allowed the current situation to exist. The government did not just offer Moderna the support, it offered everybody the support. And everybody but Pfizer, for their own reasons, being the large company that they are, uh, took that support. Because in addition to the support, what that also in involved is being part of a consortium that harmonized clinical trials, protocols, tests, a lot of open communication about the results as we were doing phase one, phase two. Phase three is a separate matter, but there was a lot of sharing. And that whole uh, thing was, was enabled by Operation Warp Speed. So yes, we, we certainly, as, as the least resourced company, felt that this was the appropriate thing to do because we were taking the money, not, not only thinking of this year, but also thinking ahead of being in a position to prepare to produce the billion, up to a billion doses next year. Uh, you should realize that the timelines are such that unless we placed orders back in June, July for hundreds of millions of doses, we would not be in a position in 2021 to deliver. So the money went to more than R&D. That's a bit of a misconception. We're going to see Americans and others around the world starting to receive these vaccines. Um, not only is the technology new, but also requiring cold chain support. Um, the infrastructure is clearly going to be challenging. As you think about this rollout, 
what are the things that are gonna be, uh, are gonna be critical to watch? What are the headlines that we wanna see? The way I think about it is that I'm not sure what our alternative was uh, because, because you know, the reality is that while we have, this country has never done this before, nobody has at this scale, uh, there is no institution that could do it as an alternative either. And so we're quite comfortable that the distribution process that's been put in place is the best chance we have. Now, what are we looking for? Uh, in the case of Moderna's vaccine, uh, we, we have many years of investment already made in ensuring a storage uh, set of conditions that are quite attractive. Um, we, that was not the original technology that exists uh, for people to use uh, would require extremely cold temperatures. But because we have been developing many other vaccines, we've already worked on improvements to both the lipid particles that we use to deliver this and the processing of them that allows us to keep the, the materials at minus 20 degrees centigrade, which freezers can handle. And then above all, a few weeks ago, we also uh, announced that we can keep vaccines up to a month in refrigerated conditions and for 12 hours on a tabletop at room temperature. What that means is that you can easily think about where the vaccine goes centrally, where it goes to the periphery, and how long any given lot can be available for that day's worth of vaccinations. And so training becomes important, uh, uh, surveillance becomes important, making sure that the right tests are done before vaccines administered, et cetera. What are the things that we don't know yet? I mean, when we're rolling out um, to billions of people vaccines that didn't exist, you know, even months ago, um, what are the things that we don't yet know? For example, you know, how long it lasts and, you know, sort of what kind of transmission, long-term side effects. What are the range of things that really we, we, we'd be much more comfortable in a year and five years' time that we're going to learn? A good question. Look, we don't know as much as we didn't know about the virus, and we still don't. In other words, when, you, when, you're, when your threat is unknown and, and new, it's hard to imagine that you can know more about your, your deterrent or your counterpunch than you do about the threat. And there's a lot we don't know about the virus. We don't know what its ultimate mutations will be. We don't know exactly how, how much mortality it can cause because it's hard to get that number given how, how we're trying to limit its spread based on techniques uh, of, of, of masks, et cetera. So there's a lot we're learning about the virus and we will also learn about the vaccine. So as you pointed out, how long will the antibody response offer protection against a new infection? Will a new infection be severe uh, after a vaccine ever, or will it always be a muted response so that even if somebody gets infected, they do not get severe COVID, which would be effectively, if you think about it, a preemptive therapeutic. So there's going to be some things we're going to learn, how long it lasts, but many of the things I mentioned. And, and I, I think that the good news is so much is being focused now on this experiment, this global experiment. I've described this to people. You know, there's, there's been the, the, the recent statements made that, uh, that the mask is perhaps the best vaccine. I view the vaccine as the best mask. It's a molecular mask. And once we have it on board once, then presumably it will protect us. We don't know for how long, but we're creating in a global collective immune system that has the information needed to, to counteract the virus wherever it attacks. The other piece of this, of course, is what percentage of the population feels comfortable with all of this. The numbers you know, went down a lot under the Trump administration. They've gone up a little bit after the Pfizer and the Moderna announcements. Hopefully that will continue. I just saw that uh, three former presidents have said that they're willing to get the vaccine publicly. And, uh, and indeed, even President Obama said that he would do it on television. Uh, do you know uh, if that's going to be a Moderna vaccine or not at this point? Uh, I don't know. I hope so, but I don't know. And I think that you know, my, my attitude is um, uh, I, think, I think at some point we're all vying to have uh, protection from whatever source we can get. And so, you know, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see from a timing standpoint. I expect these vaccines to basically come on the market within a week of each other, plus or minus. And there's a particular guide set of guidelines that's been laid out of who gets the vaccine. As we've discussed earlier, 
The, the storage conditions are such that my guess is one set of vaccine will go one direction, another will go to places which may, can handle this, and that may affect who gets which vaccine first. You guys are fairly busy right now, but I mean, I, I would assume that that technology would also apply to all sorts of other uh, viruses that we vaccinate against. Um, so, I mean, if that's the case, wh what do you think are the things that we'll be attacking uh, first beyond coronavirus with mRNA and what's the impact likely to be? So I'll give you an example. We have an active program in, in Zika virus uh, that's shown some very strong results. We have a very active program in CMV, cytomegalovirus, which is the single largest cause of birth deformities in, in, in babies born from, from, from mothers who get infected during pregnancy. No solution, no vaccine for that. First time ever, we've shown very impressive data. Uh, and several other vaccines. And of course, importantly, adjacent to the general notion of a respiratory virus is influenza. I mean, we have made do with a 50, 60 percent efficacious vaccine for influenza for a long time. We've told ourselves, oh, it's seasonal, it changes, we need eggs, we need this and that. But the reality is that it's possible, we think, that influenza can be attacked with maybe not one mRNA, but several mRNAs that cover a range of variants of the, of the presented uh, uh, proteins in that particular strain. So a lot of things to come, but already a whole lot that are way down the path and, and entering in one case soon phase three trials. So I think the technology, if anything, the, the, we accelerated, this pandemic accelerated the learnings and the data, the proof points, but the underlying science is already well on its way to make many new vaccines. And maybe just to close a little bit on the disinformation, a little bit on the anti-vaxxing sentiment, and how much of a problem does it pose in your view uh, to, to the obstacles that we need to get over uh, in order to beat this thing? In, in any debate, uh, if one side has to offer facts and the other side can offer doubts and they're considered of equal value, then the ones who offer doubts will always have an advantage because it doesn't take much to raise doubts. It takes a lot to create facts. I would argue that the best decisions are made when both sides of the argument are based on fact. And there is no fact-based argument that says that vaccines are in some way uh, problematic if properly tested, if properly administered and properly followed up. So I think that broadly speaking, I'm obviously well aware that there's a very strongly held view by some in the anti-vax community, but then in the, in the current uh, information kind of distribution systems we have with social media, et cetera, I would say the concern is that folks who, who aren't actually given facts uh, kind of confuse what are doubts and what are, what are facts as though they're the same thing. Nubar Afayan, great to be with you. Thank you.